Welcome to the Kingdom. I'm Chris, and this is Good Enough Gaming. Well, howdy, folks, and here we are one year from when I started this channel. Now, it has been quite a learning experience, to say the least. And as I've said before, I am both surprised and grateful that the channel has done as well as it has. So thanks to all of you who take the time to watch, listen, comment, and offer suggestions. Now, since starting this channel, I think I've played more games than normally I play in about two years. And after playing that much, especially as much One Page Rules as I've played, there are a few things I find myself saying over and over. I wish that worked differently. I wish they did this. I wish the game had that or didn't have this. So I thought I'd put them out there and see what the rest of you think. These are just my thoughts, and I'm quite sure that some of the things I mention here are going to be elements of the game that some of you really, really like. So please make comments on the things you agree with, disagree with, or things that you would add that you think maybe I've missed. So without further ado, let's take a look at 10 items in no particular order that I would like to see adjusted in one page rules. Number one, vehicles are a little bit OP. Now I'm a bit torn on this one because I fear that the cure might be worse than the disease, so to speak. I find that it's very rare, at least in the games I play, to make it worth going after vehicles and monsters that are more than about maybe six to nine wounds. With high toughness and two plus save, it takes such a concentrated effort to bring them down. Now sure, there are weapons with deadly, but when I bring vehicles or monsters, I make sure I kill off the units that have deadly weapons first. And once they're gone, there's not a whole lot your opponent can do without wasting their entire turn focusing fire on just that one guy who's probably gonna save most of it anyways. Now, I know that one way OPR has tried to balance vehicles and monsters is making them very expensive point-wise, which works, but that has its own problems. It means that in games of 2,000 points or less, you can only have one, maybe two, and your opponent might not have enough firepower to even threaten them. Now, one solution is to play larger games. I'm finding that a game of one-page rules really starts to feel like a full-scale battle at about 3,000 plus points. So that's one option. But this is the part where I get a little bit torn, because what if you don't want to play 3,000 points? What if you want to play smaller point games, but you still would like to see more vehicles? So here's my idea, and again, cure might be worse than the disease. What if vehicles degrade? Now, hang on, before you get all upset about this, just think about it for a sec. When you pay for a unit of 10 infantry, as that unit takes casualties, its firepower reduces, which also changes it as a target priority as the game goes on. A vehicle, however, is just as deadly at one wound left as it was with full wounds. Now, I know that the points cost is already supposed to take some of that into account, but I don't know if that's enough. Having vehicles degrade would make them like other units in the game that lose effectiveness as they take damage. Now the downside, of course, is it adds another layer of complexity or bookkeeping, which will affect points cost. It can potentially slow down gameplay as it adds in all this extra stuff. I get that. And on the flip side of this whole argument, vehicles being super strong, and I've mentioned this before, I don't like that a massive Titan can lose half of its wounds and then be eliminated entirely because it failed a morale test. I mean, think about it. A Titan with 25 wounds can be rendered useless while it still has more wounds and more firepower than most units have starting out. Now, maybe this is how One Page Rules balances the power of vehicles. They are incredibly hard to damage and they fight at full strength, they're good to the last drop, but a single dice roll in a morale phase could make them run away and they can be chased off the field. So I suppose that's one way of doing it, but it seems a little too, maybe not situational, but you gotta get really lucky to get to that. Whereas the vehicles, they're always good. And counting on making one run away at half health, I don't know if that's the best plan. What if 
we were to combine all of this somehow? What if as a vehicle took damage, it's more likely to fail morale? Or instead of routing, a vehicle becomes minus one quality, minus one defense and half movements. You know, bring in the skirmish version of Shaken, but it only applies to vehicles and monsters above say toughness nine or 12. If vehicles somehow degrade, that would also justify lowering point costs and allowing for more vehicles in smaller games. Now, I agree, this concept definitely needs some fleshing out and some testing, but I'd be up for some different ideas and suggestions. Number two, some points values I think need adjusting a bit in the Army Forge. Now first, I wanna start by saying that the Army Forge is one of the best army builders I've ever used. I have no problems with how it works. My critique is with the equation used to determine point values. There are some areas where I think it needs adjusting. For example, in Age of Fantasy, an orc mob leader has a few options to upgrade his basic melee weapon, which is three attacks and no AP. Four of the five upgrades are five points apiece. But let's take a look at it, particularly at the comparison between a great weapon and a halberd. Now, I don't know about you, but if they cost the same, I will take a guaranteed AP2 over a 1 in 6 chance at an AP4 any day. Now true, the halberd will also ignore regeneration, which is a big deal, but it's also a lot more situational. If you know you're going up against robot legions in advance, then obviously that's the better choice, but that's list tailoring, and I'm looking at this from the perspective of building a list without knowing what your opponent's bringing. So just going off of a general list building, the great weapon offers a consistent, useful bonus, whereas the halberd, it's too situational. Now, I appreciate that the balance in one page rules is determined by an equation, but I think there may be some tweaks or adjustments needed to that equation. I also appreciate that one page rules tries to keep list building easy by making all the points values in multiples of five, but that does run into the problem of some things being over or under costed just to keep them at that limit. Number three, game sizes. This is a clear holdover from the early days of one page rules when it was trying to be 40k light. A standard game in 40k was 2000 points. So a standard game of Grimdark Future was gonna be 2000 points. But since OPR is more streamlined and it's not as rule heavy, 2,000 points could go really quick, at least by comparison, which could give a positive reaction of someone thinking, wow, that was really fast, we have time to play another one, or it could lead to the negative reaction of, that's it? I do think it's a good idea to recommend games of 500 to 1,000 points for new players learning the rules. But rather than have a quote-unquote standard game size, I would just say provide guidelines. I've heard several people comment on this channel, and I agree, that a game of one page rules is about 45 to 60 minutes for every 1,000 points. So a 2,000 point game is an hour and a half to two hours, while you could play four to 5,000 points in say three to four hours. Folks migrating over from games like 40K are gonna be used to long games. And if that's what they want, I think they will be pleasantly surprised to find out that not only can one page rules deliver games of that length, but it allows them to bring way more stuff to a battle than you would bring to your typical 40k game. So instead of having the beginner's level, which I think they should keep, and then this idea of a standard game size, simply say, once you become comfortable with the rules, plan for about an hour of game time for every thousand points. Now I've heard that that 1000 points for every hour is stated somewhere on the website, but I don't think it's in the core rules or especially the beginner's guide, and I think it really should be. Simply replace the section that says full games with a statement about the points to hours limit, and then the rest is left up to the player to decide how big of a game and how many points. The one exception to that would be in the competitive or the tournament rule pack, there you want a specific number of points so that players can practice for a specific tournament size. Okay, moving on to number four, objectives. Now, since objectives are at the core of just about every mission in the game, I think it needs a little tweaking or adjusting. I like the sticky objectives, don't change that. But I think it should be more than just some of your guys and none of theirs. 
However, I understand this might not be possible to fix without going down a very deep rabbit hole. Now you could do model count. The army with more models within three inches holds the objective. That would at least give it a bit more of a feeling that I have more of a presence on the objective than you do, therefore I hold it. But you run into the situation where a Night Titan can't hold an objective because two goblins are hiding behind a wall out of line of sight, but still three inches away from the objective. Or you might have a mob of 20 that are camping on an objective and I can move in a lone survivor and bam, the objective is contested. That's like saying in a movie where a hero has infiltrated the enemy base and once he's in, well, the base is now contested. I think I would want to go with most models in three, at least as a starting point. It still allows for the potential of a clutch objective grab, but it prevents the heroic all your base are belong to us. Or what about this? What about using wounds as the measure of who holds it? It would avoid creating an additional stat for people to have to keep track of, because I do not want to have what Games Workshop has done with the new objective control stat. It could even be based on a model's current wounds rather than based on starting wounds. So going back to my previous scenario, a full health titan should absolutely be able to control an objective over a small handful of goblins. But a titan at one or two health left is in pretty bad shape. And so it's not hard to accept that a small unit of goblins or orcs or something can then successfully contest the objective. Playing a lot of games of King of the Hill really brought this one home. The game just turns into a giant mosh pit where pretty much no one ever gets the main objective unless one side gets totally wiped out and then it doesn't matter about the objective because the opponent's completely destroyed. Next, number five, heroes and named characters. Now heroes in tabletop games are supposed to be, well, heroic. Some armies are great at doing that. An alien hive lord is an absolute beast on the tabletop, though it is a bit pricey because, well, it's a monster. But other armies have heroes that are really kind of meh. Now, I get that some heroes are meant to be force multipliers and to buff other units rather than to be melee specialists or something like that in their own right, but some armies have heroes that just kind of suck. I played a game of Orcs and War Disciples. We both had heroes in units that had a quality of five. And the units they were leading were basic core troops that had a quality of four. Now it makes sense if the hero is a caster or some kind of buff hero, but these were Orcs and Goblins. These are armies where you expect the heroes to be at least as good as the units that they're leading. So one of the benefits of having a hero in a unit is to use its quality on morale tests. In our case, it was actually worse to do that. Now, obviously, you don't have to use the hero's quality, but it just seemed really odd that this hero joins a unit and leads it, but in a time of crisis, the unit isn't going to look to the hero to try and save it or rally it. Now, I could see having a special rule that allows for better quality on morale tests only, and that way you don't have to adjust the hero's quality and thus mess around more with the points. You'd be able to keep it in line without making it more powerful, kind of like what bad shot and good shot do with orc and goblin ranged attacks. You could have good leader or bad leader, and that way a leader with a quality five could test for morale on, say, a quality of four, or maybe even three. That would work really well with the human defense force where the, um, the commissars or the, uh, the company commanders, they're not necessarily crack shots with pistols and weapons, but they're leaders. So you can have a quality of five and then a leadership quality of say three. Now, when I started jotting down the notes for this video, and this is moving on to talking about name characters, there weren't any. But since I started taking the notes for this, One Page Rules has actually started releasing them. So the problem is kind of moot at this point. So Age of Fantasy was first when the Secrets of Tixal campaign introduced two named characters. Now the Assault on Malhadra has done the same thing for Grim Dark Future. So I'm guessing that over time, as each army gets new STLs, as it gets more campaign books and mission packs and things like that, we'll start to see more and more of these named characters and I think that's a really, really good thing. I definitely do not want Hero Hammer. But there are several armies that have that have heroes that just don't feel like they're worth taking unless it's entirely for narrative reasons. 
Item number six, and this one's small, but three dimensions in Warfleets. Is there any way to add a third dimension in Warfleets? The flat surface works in naval combat on Earth, but in space you have a full 360 degree range of motion. Haven't you seen the Wrath of Khan? He lost because he could only think in two dimensions. Is there any way to add a mechanic like that without A, making the game way too complicated, or B, making it too hard to keep track of? Now I realize this might be a really big ask, but it just bugs me that space is so vast and yet we are stuck on just a two-dimensional plane. Anybody have any ideas here? Number seven, morale tests. Now I think I've mentioned this in previous videos, but I want morale to be for less than half. Models in the unit or wounds in the model, not half or less. It may seem like only one model, but I think it's, it's significant, especially for units with that tough special rule. It just seems to me odd that a model at half health could panic and flee. The rule works for units of five. It's fluffy and it makes sense. Once you're below half, you're only at two, and at that point, yeah, you might think of bugging out. But when a Toughness 20 model would run away at 10 wounds, or a unit of 20 runs away with 10 models remaining, I really would like to see it change to less than half, or maybe even 25 or 30%. Really make you have to punish a unit to a fraction of its starting strength before that unit decides maybe it's time to bug out and go home. Now I noticed that Age of Fantasy Quest has a special rule, or at least a basic core rule, that models with a toughness of nine or plus can't be shaken, but instead lose D3 wounds. What about something like that for vehicles and monsters in Grimdark Future and Age of Fantasy? That might be the solution to my critique about those models being a bit overpowered, or at least a bit of a solution. It would make it worth plinking away at them because small amounts of damage could trigger morale tests, which then take off more wounds. And rather than trying to go for that Hail Mary of them failing a morale test at half and totally running away, it's more reasonable to whittle it down just like you would a unit of infantry. Number eight, activation buffs. Some hero abilities trigger when a unit is activated, but some of those need to be turned into perpetual aura abilities. Take the Human Defense Force company leader as an example. He can be given the Take Aim ability. When he activates, he can pick one other unit and give them plus one to hit. Now that's a really useful ability because most Human Defense Force units really have a bad quality. But it means unless you embed the company leader in a unit and then use the ability on his own unit, you have to waste an activation just to prep another unit. And in the meantime, you've tipped your hat and told your opponent what your plans are, so on their turn, they'll just blast away the unit you buffed, and it was all for nothing. I would suggest make that a permanent buff for the model and its unit. If it's an ability that allows a unit to move, obviously that needs to be based on activation. But abilities that give units bonuses to hit, to defense, to morale, I think some of those should be made perpetual, or at the very least, have them established and picked at the start of the round rather than when activating the unit. The skirmish games use abilities like that based on an aura system, so why not put that in Grimdark Future as well? Now, to answer my own question, I recognize that it could slow things down quite a bit as everyone will now spend time trying to move to make sure that they have overlapping auras, and that's partly what started to ruin Warhammer in 8th edition. So that's why I say, why not treat these new buffs like spell points? Instead of waiting to activate the unit, at the start of the turn, you pick what it applies to. Or maybe just reduce it to this hero and its unit, and it's a permanent buff. That reduces the benefit to just one unit, but it's a constant buff, and the point cost and force organization restrictions will still prevent players from going hero happy and embedding heroes in all of their units. All right, number nine. Balancing activations. Since the game is alternating activations, there's often a situation where one player gets to take multiple activations in a row. Even if players start off with the same number of units, casualties over the course of the game can give one player more activations than the other. 
And typically, that's not that big of a problem, because if you start it out equal, that imbalance has to do with tactical decisions, dice rolls, and it occurs over the course of the game. I think that the rule that says whoever activated last in the previous round must go second is a great way to try and address part of that activation imbalance each turn. And for a long time, I didn't think anything beyond that was really necessary. But then I saw a video from Mini Wargaming where Matthew was talking about his plans for Ravage Star and debating whether he had you go, I go, alternating activations. And he pointed out something that happened in a game he was playing with alternating activations. His opponent brought a whole bunch of total chaff units and then a couple really beefy ones. And every turn, he would simply activate a chaff unit and give it orders to stand still, move out of line of sight, just take cover, something pretty benign. But then his opponent had to go. In this case, the opponent was Matthew. And over the course of the turn, the other player got to just sit back, force Matthew to make all of his moves, and then the player got to move his more important pieces. The list build had effectively turned the game into the old-fashioned you go, I go, but with one advantage solidly on the side of the one player. Now, one could say, well, on Matthew's turn, he should have killed off as many of those uh, chaff units as possible, thus reducing the player's ability to do that, and I'm sure he would. But that would mean that when the player with the more powerful units finally got to activate, Matthew's units were more exposed, he could kill off a couple of them, and the balance would then be re-tipped in the other player's favor. So, I've played other games with alternating activations, and some of them give the player with fewer units the ability to pass on an activation. What if the player with fewer activations is given a number of passes equal to the difference, or maybe one pass for every two units of difference? Enough to prevent a situation like Matthew described. I don't know. Let me know what you think. Okay, our very last, number 10, unit leaders getting an extra attack instead of plus one to hit. So as currently written in the rules, unit leaders, like sergeants, champions, whatever you want to call them, they typically get plus one to hit. Games Workshop used to do that, and I found it annoying there too give the unit leader an extra attack instead of plus one to hit. Now, yes, I know you can just put a different colored dice and roll for the unit with that one leader, and it doesn't slow things down at all. But what if there's also a hero in the unit and there's special weapons? You could end up rolling four to five different colors of dice, trying to remember which one is what unit, what target number. Plus, you get these odd situations where a unit leader is hitting better than the hero, and that just seems wrong, as I've already mentioned. Just give the champion two attacks, have it have the same quality as the other guys in the unit, and I think that will balance out. A human defense force um, sergeant getting two attacks at quality five isn't going to make a huge difference instead of giving him one attack at quality four. So, that's my list. What do you think? What kind of things would you like to see changed? Or, are you quite happy with absolutely everything as it is? Let me know in the comments. And until next time, keep your dice on the table. And remember, it doesn't have to be perfect, as long as it's good enough. <laughs>